Turn with me to the book of John, the book of John, and we're going to look at chapter 15. John chapter 15 this afternoon. Now, John chapter 15 is a, is a great chapter in the Bible, and it starts out there, Jesus speaking and gives a, a lesson, a sermon here, I am the true vine, is uh, what it begins here, I am the true vine, but we're going to jump ahead in that a little bit as he talks about being the true vine and, and branches and all. We're going to skip ahead here to verse number 16. And I want to point out something that Jesus puts in his message to uh, not only the disciples, but others that followed him. In John chapter 15 and verse number 16, we see this verse of scripture. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit, fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye ask, ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. I want to preach out of uh, this verse of scripture on this subject, the ordination of the believer. The ordination of the believer. I want you to notice there, he says, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. The ordination of the believer. The word ordain is to place, to advise, or to appoint. To appoint. Think of that word for a minute, appoint. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and appointed you, ordained you, placed you. The ordination of the believer. Now when we think of an ordination, we think of a pastor, in some cases a deacon, that gets ordained to what God has called them to do. We think of the ordination of a preacher to the ministry or pastor, missionary, that type of thing. How many of you have been in an ordination service? Raise your hand. All right, quite a few of you. Been in ordination service. And uh, I remember and I recall my ordination service. I had been to a few before that and uh, was very nervous <laughs> about it. And I got ordained with Al Stone, who's going to be here Wednesday night. We got ordained together at the Cleveland Baptist Church. He had been working at the church there. I had been working at another church. We graduated from Bible college together and then went and worked in ministries. I had worked in uh, a church in Canada for about a year and then went to Xenia, Ohio. was working in that church at the time, was an assistant pastor there. And Brother Al Stone was working at Cleveland Baptist. And uh, that we were having some type, I can't remember what was going on. And uh, Brother Thompson said, uh, you, you two guys need to be ordained to the ministry. And so uh, that was my home church that I grew up in. And uh, Brother Al Stone was on staff there at the time. So they said, uh, we're going to ordain you both together. I thought, well, that's good because the questions that came from the preachers would be split up between two, so that may, meant, that meant I'd have 50% of the normal questions. So I was pretty glad about that. And so we got in uh, one of the rooms there, they call it, uh, uh, in, in the building there, they call it, I think they call it the chapel, and uh, it, it's a smaller auditorium, but we got in the room there, and there was a whole gang of preachers staring at me. <laughs> And uh, Al Stone and I, uh, we were so nervous the day before we were studying our brains out, and that doesn't take much for us. But anyhow, we studied and studied and, and thought we were, you know, up on everything. And then, uh, of course, you know, we got in there and the pastors all questioned us, uh, then presented us to the church. The church does the ordaining, but the council, uh, you know, uh, recommended to the church. And so we got in there, and, and uh, there was quite a few questions, and I only got stumped by one of them, and I answered the question, and I was kind of, you know, I'm a hesitant and kind of thinking, and I was kind of looking over at Alice, and I'm like, why don't you take this one? <laughs> I can't even remember what the question was about, but I remember it kind of stumped me, and I was kind of fumbling around, and uh, Brother Thompson, gracious Brother Thompson, kind of stepped in and kind of answered the question for me in a way, you know, I started stumbling and he said, well, isn't that what you believe? I said, yes, sir. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Thumbs up. Yeah, I believe that with my whole heart. Now I do. <laughs> and uh, then uh, that night, the Sunday night service, uh, Brother Thompson asked me to preach. And uh, Al Stone had preached there a few times already. And so uh, I preached that evening. I still have the tape of that message that I preached. I was really nervous, but, you know, it was, uh, it was good service. We had a great service. And uh, then we were ordained to the ministry. Um, we think of that as an ordination and uh, a special burden placed upon people and the call of God and all of that. But, you know, the Bible does say here that every believer, every Christian or is ordained, is appointed. And so we're looking at the Lord, the Lord and his appointment for every Christian. And we see that in this verse. And, and uh, we're going to look at the three parts of the ordination of the believer here this afternoon for the, uh, for the next few moments. And it's found here in verse number 16. And the, the outline of my message, I'll give it to you right off the bat and then we'll look through it. That is to produce, to persevere. And to pray. We see those things right in this verse of scripture. He says again, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go. The first thing is to go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the father in my name, he may give it you. The Lord has appointed every believer to, first of all, to go, to go. We ought to be willing to go for God, go forward for God. Now, this word go is a word that has been used a lot of different ways. I think of a church I saw one time in our travels and with my dad in evangelism. I've seen it on as kind of a model for a church. I've seen it used at a mission conference. And uh, it's this, putting the go in the gospel. And uh, they will put in bold, putting the go, G-O in bold, maybe bigger letters, in the, and then G-O for gospel, go, then gospel, make it in the gospel. Putting the go in gospel. I thought that was a good theme for a mission conference or for a church. And, and I, I don't remember where it was, somewhere at the buses, um, for a church had that theme for the church and they had it on the side of their bus, putting the go in the gospel. You know, the whole nature of the gospel is that it needs to go. It needs to go forward. And God left us here as his appointed people to go with the gospel. And so we need to go. We need to produce, as the Bible says here. We shouldn't, as God's people, we should never try to escape this ordination, going forward for God. I had a, uh, a motto uh, of uh, the, the church I pastored in Canada. We had a motto, a going church for a coming Lord. I really like that motto. I've seen a lot of different mottos that I like like that. It says something about your church. And, uh, you know, I've seen the, the distance is worth the difference, you know, that kind of thing is good. We had, when I pastored down in the Florida Keys, the pastor before me had made up a track and his, he had put as the uh, motto of the church, a church with a heart in the heart of the Keys. Well, where we were in the Florida Keys, we we're right in the middle. And so it really fit. So I just kept that. I thought it was good. And I've seen a lot of these, but a lot of these talk about going forward. We have as ours on our, on our website, we use actually a few different ones, but revealing God's greatness through the preaching of his word. Uh, it all talks about this fact that we are ordained to take the gospel, to go forward with the gospel, and it's the very nature of the gospel. Would it be the gospel and would it be the good news if we just sat on it and we didn't tell anybody? What is good news if you don't tell somebody? Amen. Right? It's just nothing. And so we must put the go in the gospel. So here's what he says in verse 16. Jesus said, I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should, what's that word? Go. go. And he says, bring forth fruit. So here's the two things. We go and we bring. We go and we bring. 
and we break. We go out, like he says, go out the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that, the, that my house may be full. We sing the song, bring them men, bring them men. That's what the Bible is talking about here. Go out to the world and bring them in. We are to bring forth fruit. But what is that fruit? What is the Bible talking about here when it talks about fruit? Some say that, and they quote Galatians 5, 22 and 23, where the Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. That's a great verse. Great two verses there. Really fit together. And we should know them. And we know that. But the Bible there in Galatians 5.22 is stating that that is the fruit of the Spirit. Capital S, that's the Holy Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? If the Holy Spirit is living in us, then we ought to have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. I mean, if the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding in our lives, that's the type of people we ought to be. Amen. That's the fruit of the Spirit. But what is the fruit of the Christian? <clears throat> he says, I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit. Well, what is the fruit of an apple tree? Apple. Apples. You don't go to the apple tree and think you're going to pick tomatoes. Amen? You go to the apple tree to pick apples. It produces what it is. So what is the fruit of the Christian? Is to produce Christians. Christians. Amen? That's what the Bible is saying here. That is the fruit of the Christian life. That's what we are to produce. We're to get somebody and see them get saved. That's why we should go and give the gospel to see people get saved and to bring them to church and see them baptized and then following along in the Lord. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but uh, here in the message, but that's what we are to do as God's people. Our fruit is other Christians. In order to accomplish this task, you must do it by faith. You must trust God by faith. I preached on that in the morning message. It takes faith to produce. If you don't have uh, uh, that faith in God, you're not going to produce. And like I preached this morning, that's putting faith in action. Is producing fruit for the Lord. Are you producing fruit? We talk about faith, promise, missions, giving. Our giving to God of missions is by faith. By faith, we promise to God, this is what I'm going to do. And by faith, we give it every week. And we see how God gives it back to us. It is produced through faith. Thank God that we can be a part of a mission program that's reaching people around the world and spreading the gospel around the world that people can be saved. And so by our giving in that respect, we are also producing fruit. That's why on Wednesday night, I'd like to take Wednesday night and take the time at the beginning of the service to read and hit the highlights of a missionary letter. And we put the letters in the back there on the table and so that you can look through and read because it is a picture of our production as a church producing fruit not only here in our community but around the world. Yeah. There are a lot of ways that we can produce fruit. God help us, we should be doing that. And by the very fact that we're recording sermons here and putting them out on the internet where people around the world can watch and listen and hear uh, and, and know how to be saved by the preaching of the gospel. We ought to use every tool and opportunity that we can to get the, wor get the world the gospel of Jesus Christ, to spread the message to them that Jesus saved. That's what people need to hear. That's what they need today. You must have faith to accomplish this. There must be a vision. There must be a vision. Where there is no vision, the people perish. If there's not somebody that has a vision of going forward and, and working for God and seeing people get saved, God help us to have a vision. 
We need to have a vision. There must be concern. There needs to be a burden in all of our hearts. Oh God, burden us. Give me that burden for lost souls to, so that I can see them get saved. I pray. I ask God. I don't want my heart to get callous. It's awful easy to get a callous heart. You know what I mean? And the older you get as a Christian, uh, even though you might be a young person or an older person, but if you've been saved a long time, it's awful easy to get to the place where you, it becomes a habit instead of something special. You know what I'm saying? You know, coming to church and hearing the preaching and singing the songs, uh, it, listen, it ought to always be fresh and exciting and, and new to us. I know it to be something like that. New and exciting to get the word of God. We must be concerned. Sometimes we get to the place where we have a tendency to get unconcerned. You know what you need to do? If your heart starts to get unconcerned, is get to the altar of this church and kneel down before God and say, God, break my heart again. Amen. Amen. I don't want to get unconcerned. I always want to be concerned about every person I see, every person I talk to. Are they saved? Do they know Christ? So first of all, he ordains us to produce. Secondly, is to persevere. Persevere. Now notice what he says in the verse again. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Your fruit should remain. Not always does the fruit remain. Amen? We've seen people come to church. We've seen people get saved. We've seen people come for a while, even get baptized and come for a while, and then fall off. I hate when fruit doesn't remain. I think God hates it too. We want to see fruit, and we want to see it remain. That means to persevere. It takes three things for this. Let me give you the three things. Write these down. It takes character. It takes courage. And it takes consistency. It takes character, courage, and consistency. First of all, it takes character. I told someone a few years ago, they were talking to me about this type of doing this and serving the Lord in their testimony. I said to them this, your testimony is not what you do in the next weeks or months. Your testimony is what you do in the next years. Amen. What am I talking about? Perseverance. It's not some six week splash in the pan and then they're gone. It's not like, oh, I'm going to start serving the, serving the Lord and a few months later you quit. It's that perseverance of continuing on and being determined I'm going to serve the Lord no matter what comes my way. I think I talked about this last week, but let me bring it up again. Just recently, uh, a, uh, a good friend of mine at Cleveland Baptist Church, Brother Richard Harris, passed away. Brother Richard Harris in that church and for a long, long time, for many, many years, and how he served the Lord. A, a picture of perseverance. Uh, as I said, I think he was the um, Sunday school superintendent at Cleveland Baptist for, I'm going to say, uh, at least 40 years. Hey, listen. <laughs> That takes work. That takes perseverance. You know what it takes? It takes character. No. Oh, we have such a weakness of character in our nation today. That's right. People without character. Don't let that be said of you. No excuse for you not to have character. Not, no excuse for you not to be on time to things and, and, and to work hard at what you're doing and have a good testimony to others and a testimony that lasts, that continues on with that proper character for God. So many, so many today are, especially children, are just, just let go and let them do whatever they want to do and 
and, and you know, not get their homework done and not get their things done and all. It takes character to sit down and get your things done. I mean, I, you know, as a kid growing up, I got that hammered into me when we got home from school. We were allowed about a, you know, about a half an hour break there just to kind of unwind. And then it was get your homework done. It was hard in my house. My mom, the iron fist. You're not going to play. You're not going to play with your toys. You're not going to goof around. You're not going to talk and goof around till your homework is done. I mean, that was it with mom. My dad used to say, I don't know what's wrong with them teachers. I mean, can't they teach what they're supposed to teach while you're in that school for all them hours? Why do you have to bring work home? It was a little hard to do in my house. I mean, we always wanted dad to be the one that, you know what I mean? But, uh, <laughs> uh, but hey, we, we, the hammer was put down on us. Get that work done. My brother would say, can't we play first and then work? No, 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 no. Get your work done. Character of getting things done. You start a job, finish the job. Amen. Finish the job. It takes character to do that. I'll bet you I have, I'll bet I have at least 10 books right now that I've started reading and got through the first couple of chapters. You know what? It take, I, I have to make myself finish the book. I just got on the last chapter of one of, one of those books right now. I'm like, get it done. I want to get it done. I'm done. I've read the book. It's finished. You know what I'm saying? It takes character to do that. To be consistent and persistent in all that you do. It takes, number two, it takes courage. It takes courage. How many people in the Bible can we find that, had, that were courageous people? Do you know why their names are in this book, like Elijah and what he did? Wow, amazing. David and uh, then Joshua, whom we're studying about, Moses and Abraham, and then in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul and all of those. Uh, you know why? Daniel, if we think of Daniel, what a man of courage. You know why we read about that? Because they had courage. I'm sure they were afraid like anybody else was afraid. I'm sure there was fear in their heart. They're human beings like you and me. I'm sure that Moses, when he went up there and stood at the Red Sea and had that staff in his hand and started to raise it up, thought, what if this doesn't happen? Boy, am I going to look bad. We, that's, I mean, that's human nature, isn't it? I mean, I kind of you know, think he probably had those thoughts, but you know what? God had proven himself through the, all the plagues and all those things, and you just got to do it by faith and trust God. Amen. I mean, I, I, I remember uh, uh, working in that church in Canada, going to go buy that property and all that money that was going to cost and everything. And I thought, I just thought, you know what? If, <laughs> if this doesn't go, I'm going to look bad. And then I thought, no, you know what, Lord? You're going to look bad too because you told me to do this. You know, if it doesn't, if it falls through, what's going to happen here to our test? Sometimes it has to... You have to put it all on the line. You know what I'm saying? And trust God. It takes courage to do that. And it takes consistency. That's what perseverance is, really. Consistency. All of the time. Here's what, go, go to verse 4 of this chapter. John 15. Look at verse 4. Here's what he says. Abide in me, Jesus speaking. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. What is consistency? It's abiding in Christ. You have to abide in Christ. You have to walk with him and have fellowship with him and listen to him and let him lead you and let him guide you and let him make your decisions for you and, and, and do what he says He's our leader and our boss. We listen to him. You see, inconsistency in the Christian life leads a bad taste in the mouth of the unsaved. It's a bad testimony when Christians aren't consistent. It is a bad testimony. You know, like the Christians that members of this church that 
come to church here and come to church there. They come for one week and they miss three. And they come for two weeks and they miss five. And they, it's a bad testimony. Right. Amen. The members of Village Baptist Temple ought to be in the house of God every time the service is open. Amen. You know, unless you, you have to work or you're sick or something, you ought to be in the house of God. Right. But too many people are laying out of church. It's a bad testimony of the house of God. It ought to be our desire to produce fruit. It ought to be the desire to bring people to church with us and, and see them get saved. And, and you know, you look around this auditorium and you look here and say, well, I don't like the color orange. I don't like these orange pews. Well then invite some more people and put their bodies in them and cover up the orange. Amen. Amen. Don't complain about it. Do something about it. We've got to be consistent in producing fruit. God help us to do what he says. Inconsistency. God doesn't like it. God doesn't like inconsistency. You know what it says in Revelation chapter 3 verse 16? It says of the inconsistent church there. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot. You're, you're inconsistent. You're neither cold nor hot. Can't figure out what you are. I will spew thee out of my mouth, God says. God doesn't like it when we're unfaithful. God help us to be faithful to him. John 15, verse 16. Notice there. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit. That's produce. And that your fruit should remain, that's persevere. And then look at the last part of the verse. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. You know what that asking is? That's pray. Amen. Pray. Produce, persevere, and pray. You know, when we talk to God, it's conversation with God. When we pray, God delights in it. God delights in hearing us pray. I kind of compare it to this. On our phones, we have an app that's called Marco Polo. How many have Marco Polo? Anybody? Marco Polo. I really like Marco Polo because I keep in touch with my grandkids. Now, my grandkids are on there, and Sharon and I are driving around or something, and we hear those little voices. You know? talking. We shut off everything else. I want to hear my grandkids. I want to hear what they have to say and what they're doing and what's going on and, you know, all, all of that. And they'll, they'll show some toys and things like that and, and talk about this and talk about that. But, oh, do I love when they say, and grandpa, that means they're talking to me. You know, everybody else, step aside. My grandkids are speaking to me. How I love to hear from my grandkids. Just their voice. Whatever's going on. For a little while there, um, my, uh, the family over in Ashland, John and Beth, um, they had, oh, oh, what was it? They, they had just closed their school, so now the kids are back home. Those poor kids, they've been in school and home and in school and home and in school and home. You know what I'm talking about? Back and forth, they've been crazy. It's about to drive Beth crazy. She tried, She tried. Actually, she got a job, and then she had to quit her job because her kids are home, and it, it, it's just been crazy. So at the beginning of that, and I try to keep this going, but you know with kids, it's pretty hard to keep things. But every day, her daughter, Christy, was given us, and I call it the Christy Report. She would get up in the morning and she would get on her mom's phone on that Marco Polo and say, well, today, in that little, oh, I love that little squeaky boy. Well, today, uh, we are going, I'm going to go with mommy to work. And uh, Clayton went with uh, daddy. And, and she's given a report and, oh, I get on there and give me that report. I want to hear that every next day. She goes, now today, and she'd talk about what they're, and what they did yesterday and I mean, I call it the Christie Report. I couldn't wait for that. Of course, it was hard to keep it going. She's not doing it anymore once in a while, but, oh, that was great. You know, it delights me to hear from them. Used to be just 
on the telephone. But now I can see them. That delights me. Kind of makes me think that that's how God is. When we speak to him. Amen. He delights in it. When we pray. Joy to his heart. As our father. God the father. Hears us crying to him. There's nothing more that I would like. Than if one of my kids. Or grandkids get in trouble. Is to call out for me. Because they know I can help. Or do anything I could to help. Hey God in heaven wants to hear us call out to him. When we're in trouble. When we're alone. And we don't know what to do. He wants to be our help. And the one we lean upon. And the one we hold to. God delights when we pray. Here's what it says in Proverbs 15. It says the sacrifice of the wicked. Is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright. Is his delight. Think of that. What a comparison. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Uh, the, the sinful person, the person that has not had their sins forgiven, even when they come to God with a sacrifice, it's not pleasing to God, it's an abomination to God. To bring even a sacrifice. But the prayer of the upright, the upright is those that have had their sin forgiven. Forgiven. Those are in the center of God's will. The prayer, the asking, that's what he says here in John 15, verse 16. That whatsoever ye shall ask. That's the prayer of the upright, the Bible says, is his delight. He delights in it. God finds pleasure when we talk to him out of a pure heart. Amen. No doubt about it. So pray. Pray. That's what he's talking about here. When we come to him and we ask him, in the, in the, as the verse says, the Father in my name, he may give it you. You know, God is a giving God. He wants to give us more blessing. He wants to bless us more. Many times we don't get the blessing because we don't ask. Right. And we don't depend upon him. <laughs> Prayerlessness is sin. Think of that. Prayerlessness is sin. I'll be, I'll, I'll be honest with you. All right? Confession to you. Many times I go to the Lord and I say, Lord, I'm sorry for not praying like I should. Not praying like I should. I'm sorry. I bet I've said that a thousand times to the Lord. God help us. To know he delights when we come to him. Amen. Prayerlessness is sin. Some forget. You really shouldn't forget. Amen. I mean you can forget other things. But don't forget to talk to God every day. Amen. Don't forget some neglect. And some reject. Hey when you came to Christ and you got saved. You know what you did? You talked to God. You prayed. Amen. And you asked him to forgive you and to be your Savior. You speak to God in prayer. Don't you think that delights God? <laughs> no. There's joy in heaven, the Bible says. It's not just the, the saints that are there and the angels around the throne of God. It's God himself rejoices over one sinner no. that repents. This is the ordination. We are ordained, as the Bible tells us, to produce, to persevere, and to pray. Do we care enough about this lost world that our ordination means something to us? God help us. If you haven't prayed that prayer and asked the Lord to save you, you need to trust him by faith and be born again. He loves you and wants to save you.